was born in New Jersey, and um, I am the youngest of five. So I was, I had, uh, I was very spoiled, at least with love. I had a lot of older siblings who doted on me and took good care of me, and so I had a, a really good childhood. Um, I had a, a very demanding father, and part, I think that, although sometimes he could be harsh with me, I think that um, his, he spurred me on to to be, a, you know, sort of an overachiever and, um, you know, really try to be the best that I could be. Um, and my mother was and still is um, my biggest cheerleader and very supportive and loving. And um, when I was uh, 12, we moved to Las Vegas and I... I grew up in more or less in Las Vegas. I went to junior high school, high school, and college there. I get I get this sort of shocked reaction a lot when I say that because um, people have a, a mindset about Las Vegas and they don't think that I sort of match that that kind of person. But I think that that um, it helped me become more of a fun-loving person, and I also have uh, made I made a lot of friends in Las Vegas that I still have today, and I. Um, also uh, learned a little bit about economics and um, about um, addiction and how you know people deal with um, gambling and things like that. But I also around in and around Las Vegas, there's a lot of beautiful natural wonders. And you know we did a lot of hiking and and climbing, and uh, so I really learned to appreciate the outdoors too. Well, the thing about Las Vegas is that gambling is everywhere. I mean, you go into the from from the airport when you first arrive to the Seven Eleven where you stop to get your Slurpee to the you know some even gas stations to the grocery stores, and so even if you don't live you know in downtown or uptown, you are you are constantly tempted um, to to gamble if if, if you're so inclined to do so. Um, and when I was growing up, there wasn't, it was sort of a man's town, and um, there wasn't a lot there for families or children to do. And we, in other ways, it was it was growing, it was a lot like growing up anywhere else, except that just about everybody had a pool in their backyard, and um, we would go to like Circus Circus, which was fun, and um, we could walk to the showboat, which had a bowling alley, and so we would bowl, which I think is an experience of a lot of children. Um, but the uh, you know my friend's father was a you know a, a car dealer and um, and you know you know why babysat for a woman who was a showgirl and those are sort of somewhat different experiences from from other people. What were the conversations like around the dinner table? What did your family? How did they interact? And how were you part of those conversations? Um, well. We, there was my my father loved to argue and and actually both my parents loved to argue and so they and they um, encouraged us to argue and so there was always you know debates and my father would often play the devil's advocate even if he agreed with you he would make you um, say uh, sort of stand up for yourself and, and and justify whatever your position that you were taking so I think I learned to be a good debater. Um, Sometimes those arguments got testy and um, uncomfortable, but I think that's true of you know any family. And um, I think that we were always challenged to think and to not just spew whatever was on our minds, but to actually um, to be thoughtful and and to have justifications for our opinions. And then, as the youngest child, you probably had to stand up for yourself a little bit. <laughs> A little bit, a little bit. I did, I did. You know, my, my as I said, my siblings were were very loving, and um, the one who was closest in age to me, we did have some little, you know, um, tensions between us. And mom, she's picking on me, kind of thing, which is which is typical. But you know, then we became the best of friends, and um, I'm still very close to her. Were you a studious child? Very much so very much so. And um, it used to annoy my, my, my the, the sister that would pick on me somewhat because she um, would, uh, you know, people would 
would point in. She said, "Oh, well, you know, you're you're book smart, but I'm I'm street smart." And um, there was a, a sort of a joke in my family that um, I, I I was studious, but that I didn't have any common sense, and that and that would would hurt me but i i would you know got very good grades and my father would you know i'd come home with a report card and there'd be five a's and one b and he'd say what is this b and i'd be like wait a minute <laughs> what about the a's mm -hmm. and but again that, that that was part of i think what pushed me uh, academically and and in other ways uh, and part of it was you know trying to please my father and, mm -hmm. and you know trying to be the the best person that i could be were there any historical events uh, in your childhood, maybe up through high school, or local happenings that influenced you to maybe want to go to a particular field of work? I had um, always been interested in science, and um, anytime there was any kind of a scientific discovery in, in any field, I was always very interested in it, and our, we always had uh, books and magazines around the house, uh, National Geographic, and, and things like that, that that our parents encouraged us to read. And so I was always, um, you know, aware of things that, that were going on in the world. You know, at one point I wanted to be an astronaut uh, until I found out that there that they had discovered that there was probably no life on other planets within our solar system. And I knew that we probably would not be reaching outside of our solar system anytime soon. And I said, if there's no life on those other planets, I don't want to go. Because <laughs> I was more interested in, you know, communicating with alien life forms or something. Mm -hmm. You were studious, you liked science. So did you have specific career plans early on? Yes. Um, well, it's interesting because I, I also um, like to read very much. I was an avid reader, and I and I like to write. And I like you know started with short stories and stuff. And um, when I was in high school, I had thought um, that I I wanted to be a writer, and I took a biology class. And my biology teacher was wonderful, and he really um, saw a promise in me and told me so. And said and asked me, you know, he said, "Are you going to college? And what are you going to study?" And I told him that I was going to be an English major. And he said, "Why? Why would you do that?" And I said, "Well, I, I want to write." And he was very disappointed. And a um, little while later, he says, um, "He says, well, I, th I think you should go and study biology in college." And I said, "Well, I want to be a writer." And he says, "But you could write biology books." <laughs> <laughs> and he was very encouraging. But I still, I still wanted to. I wanted to. And I, I when I took. English and one of my English teachers was asking me, well, what are you going to study in college? And I told her English and she said, are you crazy? And I said, really? She said, do you want to end up like me? And I was like, well, it would be terrible, but I, she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to write. And she says, well, you don't have to be an English major to, to write. And um, so I said, well, you know, maybe I should rethink about this. And, and, and I really did enjoy biology and I was very good at it. And so that's when I decided to um, um, become a biology major. Well, what is it about biology that caught your interest? Well, I think that, um, as I said, you know, from, from a very early age, I was very much in, interested in science. And um, the thought of discovering things was, was very intriguing. And the... Um, I do remember, you know, some of the, the books that my, my parents had. There was like, you know, this Time Life book and it was The Body. And I just remember just poring over this book and being just fascinated with it and and thinking this was so, so amazing. You know, it's, and it's sort of amazing to me that my parents had all this, this for us and encouraged us to look at it because, you know, I don't know if I would have had that same um, interest. And... Um, when the, the biology class that I took, we did really interesting experiments, and I just was really taken with it. And I thought, it's it's this life that we have is so amazing, and and how does it work? How do we work? And I, there's a story that one of my oldest sister tells that when I was I don't know I was probably five or less that I came up to her one day and I said, how do our brains work? And she was like, oh, my God, what a question for a five-year-old. And she was, she, she said, I, I can't answer that question, you know. And, 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 and so I've always been sort of wondering those kinds of things, those kinds of questions. You decided uh, on getting your undergrad degree in biology then at University of Nevada. And did you go straight into your Ph.D. after that? I took a year off. Um, I had been... 
I hadn't been sure whether or not I wanted to go to medical school or whether I wanted to go to graduate school. And I had had um, um, a biology professor who had encouraged me to get a, a, a medical degree or an MD, PhD, and um, had said, you know, that it would open many more doors and, and so forth. And I had, um, I had studied for the, the medical college admission, admissions test and like, I don't know, a few days before I was scheduled to take it, I did one of the practice tests and I got, I like aced the biology portion and I bombed like everything else. And I said, you know what? I, I can't take it right now because I'm not ready. But it was, I, the relief off of my shoulders was so great that I said, you know what? This is maybe not the thing for me. And, um, and when I started uh, you know, thinking about graduate school and started looking into graduate programs, I felt much more excited than I had been when I was thinking about uh, perhaps going into medical school. And I thought really what I wanted to do was research. And you can do that with a PhD um, just as well as you can with an MD. And, and so that's, um, that was one of the, and, 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 and interestingly enough, around this time, I, I forgot to mention that uh, my father, when I was um, a sophomore in college, um, became ill with cancer, and he had mesothelioma, which um, is basically, I think it still is, but it certainly was at the time, incurable. And um, he had worked in asbestos for asbestos mining for a lot of his professional life, and his father had too, and he. Had, it's interesting because my one of my older sisters was in medical school at the time, and he sort of sat her down and said, "I want you to find a cure for this." And I felt a little like, well, "What about me?" Um, but and she she went on to become a family practice, and she didn't really do much in the area of research. But I I listened to what he said, and again, he was still having a very powerful influence on me, and um, and so I thought. I'm going to find a cure, maybe not for mesothelioma, but maybe for, for cancer or something. And so that had um, figured in uh, a lot to my decision to get a PhD mm -hmm. because I had wanted to do research on, in, in, in uh, the field of cancer. Do you recall your first exposure to research, the idea of research? Well. Well, the idea of research probably, you know, as I said, from a very early age and, you know, um, uh, just hearing things on the news and, um, and reading the books that I read. But my first experience of actually being in research was, um, I think it was a freshman, freshman or sophomore in, in college and in, you know, basic psychology class, which I think is very typical that uh, to get extra credit. Um, you offered an opportunity to be in research, and it's usually student research, and it was in my case, and I was in a couple of the, the studies that they had. And I thought it was a wonderful experience. I thought that it was a, uh, a, a really great opportunity to see, you know, the kinds of questions that people were asking. And, 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 and you know, admittedly at the time, and particularly because there were students, some of the questions were very uh, simple and straightforward. But to actually see, you know, how the informed consent process worked and how the actual study worked, um, it was very interesting for me. And so that was one of my first exposures. And, and it, was, uh, it was fairly positive. Although one of the studies I was in, it was like a memory study. And she had us read a, um, a, a uh, an excerpt from, and it turned out to be a textbook, and it turned out to be a biology textbook. And then she, we were, she was doing something, and then we were supposed to recall as much as we could of the passage. And I said, you know what? I may bias your, your results because I'm a biology major. And so I think they ended up throwing out my results because of that. But <laughs> <laughs> it, was still, it was still a nice experience. Now that you have so much more experience in research than that young you doing the psychology extra credit, do you have any observations about that process back then? I think that I didn't know, I didn't understand enough about why they were doing the study. And that may be just because my memory um, isn't good or because I was just like, well, let's, let's get on with this, um, or, or maybe because they didn't explain it well enough. Um, and I, you know, I wonder how, um, how, 
well thought out their 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 experiments were and and if they were really asking an important question but it's hard for me to 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 know that without without really having read the protocol and um and known more about the field so the experiences that i had in um um in the psychology you know experiments was very positive. But when I was in graduate school, I also had an opportunity to be in a research study when um, I was having my uh, wisdom teeth excised, which is also something that, that many people at that age have to go through. And I went to school at the University of Pittsburgh. And when I was wandering through the halls, uh, I saw uh, an advertisement, you know, earn $50 to be in a study. Well, as a, as a struggling graduate student, um, $50 was a lot of money. And so I, you know, I was like, well, I'll do just about anything for $50 and I need to get my wisdom teeth out anyway. So let's, let's check it out. And so I, uh, signed up to be in a, in a drug study and it was for a, a, a pain reliever. And I couldn't tell you right now what pain reliever it was. They, they, they told me at the time that it was, um, a drug that was approved for pain, but it, it hadn't, it, it wasn't labeled specifically for, you know, excision of wisdom teeth. And so they wanted to uh, get approval for, for that specific indication. And that much at least I understood. Um, what they, um, and there was a, a, a placebo arm of the study, and there was uh, also an aspirin arm of the study. And um, if you've ever had your wisdom teeth excised, you know it can be very painful. And uh, after the excision was done, they, uh, uh, you know, brought me into a room and they said, well, we're just going to sit here and we're going to wait until the, um, the, the drugs that they gave you during the surgery have worn off. And then we're going to give you the experimental or, you know, whatever arm of this, of the study that we don't know that you're, that you've been randomized to. And then we're going to wait for, you know, 20 minutes or half an hour, whatever it was. And you're going to tell us, you know, what your level of pain is. And so the, um, the, the, the pain medication wore off. They gave me whatever it was. I'm fairly certain it was placebo because I sat there for half an hour crying, tears streaming down my face in agony. And I, and the nurse would say, do you, you know, at any point we can, um, we can stop this and I can give you Percocet, which is, you know, what you give somebody who's had that surgery. Um, and I said, well, I still get my $50. And she said, no. And I said, well, then I'll just sit here and cry. And it was, you know, now what I know that that was pretty coercive that they should have said, of course, you'll still get your $50. This is important data. And, um, you know, we're going to, uh, give you Percocet if you really need it. But no, they made me sit there in agony for a half an hour, um, until they, they, um, were able to, to medicate me. And, um, uh, I think that that, I think that that was unethical and, and that really, helped make me become the person that I am and cons being concerned about human subject protections because I don't think that they thought that they were doing anything wrong, even though that probably had to be hard for that nurse to sit there and watch me cry that whole time and wanting to help me. And she kept saying, do you, do you want a Percocet? I can give it to you now. But I just refused because I needed that money. I think that, that a lot of um, people who are in this field have not been a research subject or they've been a research subject and they were like me in the in the early 80s having only positive experiences and not realizing what can go wrong mm -hmm. and you know I think my experience was was small and compared to some of the things that that have happened to people I was um, interested in sort of the basic biology of, of tumor genesis and the, um, you know, what are the molecular switches inside a cell that make things go awry. And I had, I had 
it had seemed to me that, you know, cell biology and molecular biology was the nirvana, you know, because that's, that's where everything is decided as, as, to, as far as how a cell is going to behave and then how a system is going to behave and then to some extent how the human being is going to be and as well as, as far as health. And, um, so I was really interested in that. And, um, I, in, uh, particular is because of the, 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 um, professor I was working with and, and, uh, the interests of the lab and so forth, uh, got into, uh, looking at uh, glucocorticoid receptors, and the um, they were important in in certain um, oncogenesis related to the the system that we were working with. But mostly, I was focusing on their biology and biochemistry, and, um, and so I'd gotten a little farther afield from from cancer, but it was still interesting. But it was to some extent, it was not. Um, it was not something that I would have said, oh, this is, this is what I absolutely have to work on and want to work on. It was more of this is what was available and what my professor wanted me to work on. And so when I went to, uh, after I graduated, I, um, you know, had the opportunity to do a postdoctoral fellowship. And the, uh, the place that I chose and, you know, I was offered was, um, actually with, uh, uh, George Vandewood, who was doing, you know, really interesting stuff on, on, on oncogenesis and, and basic biology there. And, and, but he was really interested because I had this steroid biochemistry background and, and so he said, well, I'll hire you to do that. But I said, but you know, I really want to do more in the, in the, in the basic, um, oncogenesis. He says, oh, well, we, we've got some projects there too for you to work on. And, and so I, um, helped, uh, clone, um, a proto-oncogene and, uh, developed a, um, uh, transgenic mouse that was a knockout for that uh, proto-oncogene and and you know this this so I was finally doing stuff that I really wanted to do and I thought you know what I, I got down to the to this you know the, the nirvana and it wasn't I, I still I felt like it wasn't really doing it for me and um, and so I, after, after two years in the postdoc and, you know, I sort of accomplished what I thought I could accomplish. And, um, I had, um, a friend who, who we had gone to graduate school together and she was a little bit older than me. And she had known right from the, the day she graduated from when she got her PhD that she didn't want to continue to do work at the bench. And so she had gotten a job at the National Institutes of Health in, um, in the um, National Institute of Mental Health doing science policy. And so I started talking to her, so what is the science policy of which you speak? And um, is it something that maybe I might be interested in? And she says, well, you know, these are some of the issues that we're working on. And, and it sounded interesting. And her, um, her boss had recently, uh, who's Lana Skirball, and she had recently taken the position at, in the office of the director um, uh, at NIH in uh, basically in, in charge of the Office of Science Policy for all of NIH. And um, she uh, put us in touch and uh, they, they brought me on first as a, as a contractor, contract employee. And um, the, the work was just fascinating. And we were doing things, uh, I felt like I had more, um, it was much more interesting for me. And I felt like it was more, more influential than some little project that I might work on in the lab with my, with my limited, um, um, abilities. And I felt that it was, it was really important for the lives of more people too, mm -hmm. and easier to put into practice. And so what exactly was the work? So some of the things that I worked on, uh, are things that, that you will see the bridge between that and what I'm doing now. 
So they were things related to uh, fetal tissue research, uh, human embryo research, stem cell research, human cloning, and things like that. And so I became really enmeshed in the ethical issues related to these, um, these areas of research and these areas of science policy. We did a lot of reading and we did a lot of writing. And we, actually I was first hired to, to, to draft the uh, congressional justification, to help draft the congressional justification for NIH to basically tell Congress, or ask Congress we need more money because we've done such amazing things. And um, so the, 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 my writing interest was really um, taken up with that. And so I enjoyed that. And then, um, you know, once the congressional justification is written, then I started getting into these more other issues. And it involved um, doing writing for, for other folks at NIH and for folks uh, on the Hill and, um, and, you know, helping to advise the director of NIH about what, what are some of the policy issues here? What are, what are people talking about? What are the concerns that people have about these areas of research? What do we need to be looking out for? What, um, and helping to, uh, I, I helped draft the, um, the, the guidelines for stem cell research and um, looking at, you know, the, the research that people were doing in fetal tissue research and, and uh, reviewing some of the issues that came up in, in that kind of research, fetal tissue transplantation research in, in particular, and, and giving presentations at various places and educating people about what, what is this research actually doing, what does it mean, what are the uh, pros and cons of it, and what are the ethical issues around it. And so it was, um, it was very interesting and being on um, interagency uh, working groups to talk about some of these issues and issues uh, related to uh, genetics research and um, I help, helped um, uh, put together a panel that uh, looked at the, um, some of the social and um, uh, ethical issues related to genetics research. And did, did you have any ethic, ethics training in school? Not at all. Did they, did, did you bring in ethicists to advise their Absolutely. Work? I mean, you know, so part, part of this work was putting together panels mm -hmm. and, um, you know, looking at asking them, what do you think about these issues? Uh, we had one, one of the, one of the projects that I worked on, and this is a project in which I met um, uh, Robert Levine. And we had, there was a, a research study at NIH that involved giving, um, it was a needle exchange study. And, and they were looking at the, um, you know, seeing whether, uh, you know, a certain type of needle exchange would actually reduce uh, the rate of, of um, you know, HIV infections in the area, and and there was a, a control group where they weren't getting the needle exchange, and, and, and an organization, um, gosh, it might have been Public Citizen, but I this has been a while, um, came in and said that this is unethical. You can't do this study because we know needle exchange works, and so you can't have this control group. And so we put together a panel of experts, and, and Bob Levine was the chair of that panel, and. Um, you know, and they wrote a report in which they, uh, you know, recommended to the um, director of NIH that they thought that the study was ethical, but they, you know, made some recommendations. And actually, um, um, uh, Dr. Varmus, who was the director of NIH at the time, made some changes to the research as a result of that. And so, you know, I was learning from the best in, in, at, at, a, at a very um, early time in, in my career in that area. And I also was beginning to interact with other folks, as I said, within the Department of Health and Human Services in these interagency work groups who, you know, were this was their nuts, nuts and bolts, including folks from OPRR at the time. And um, I think they saw a little spark in me. And so um, um, Tom Puglisi took me aside and said, how would you like to work for OPRR? And, and I said, I would love to. And so I applied for a position there. And I actually didn't get the first job that I applied for. They, they hired one of the people they hired instead of me was Elise Summers, so they um, they you know they made a good a good decision there, but um, 
the the then the next time a position came up they asked me again, are you still interested? And I said, yeah, I am. And um, sure enough, I, uh, I applied for this was in the, in the compliance, uh, compliance oversight. And I had, when he had told me before that the other position was in the education position, I was like, oh, wow, that is just perfect for me. I just, I think that would be wonderful. And when he told me then the, the next position was in the compliance division, I was like, oh, I don't know about that. But, you know, I thought at least I'll get my foot in the door and I'll start in compliance, but then I'll move to education, right? Well, I did not anticipate loving compliance so much, and um, and I still get to do some of the education stuff, but I just I really had a knack for it. And one of the things that I think that I really loved about compliance, and I think that made me a really good compliance coordinator, was first of all my background in science and getting a PhD and being having to be so analytical and really needing to get down into the details. So this part of going down into the nirvana and, 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 and focusing on all the details, you have to be able to do that. But you also be, have, to have to be able to step back and see you know, the forest for the trees, which was one of the reasons why I left uh, the bench. And so it was able to bring it all together and also the ethics background. And my genuine concern for folks who were actually in research, having been in research studies and knowing that, that those people can be vulnerable and that um, there can be uh, bad outcomes because of people not doing things right. And so that was, um, it was like, wow, I found my niche, you know, after how many years? And, and it was, and it was, I was only in the division for, uh, three years before they approached me and said, um, we think you might make a good director for this division. I don't know why this makes me smile so broadly, <laughs> but most people, if you say, Compliance oversight, they do <laughs> wrinkle their nose like that. They go, oh my God. Uh -huh. And it's just, I just find it endearing and lovely that your whole face lights up. <laughs> I mean, I guess we want someone who really yeah. likes this to be in charge. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And I have found that, um, you know, some of the best compliance oversight coordinators are people who are like that, who are detail oriented, who are very analytical. So other scientists, we've had um, a lot of folks with law degrees. And, you know, I've even been told to some extent to, by, by lawyers, well, you, you sort of have an honorary law degree because of the work that you do and the way that you think. And, and um, I, 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 I find that to be a great compliment. And I think that the, um, the being, being very analytical is very important and also just caring about the people who are in the research. Our division talks to more research subjects than any other division within OHRP because we are the ones, when somebody calls the, the main number and says, you know, I was in a research study, it goes to compliance because like more often than not, those people are calling because they've got a complaint that something has gone wrong, that something about the research was not um, to their liking or that they feel like they weren't informed adequately about what happened in the research or family members of folks who were in research. And so we get to, um, we get to talk to them and to, to, to really hear about some of the anguish that they go through when things don't happen the way they should. And sometimes it's, it's, it's not anybody's fault. Sometimes, you know, research can have risks. And so sometimes people do get hurt, but everybody followed the regulations. Everybody acted in an ethical manner. And so sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes it's just a matter of reassuring people that, that you know, I hear you, I feel your pain, um, but there isn't really anything that our office can do. The, um, but... What goes along with that is there are also a lot of people out there who have serious mental illness who believe that they are the subject of research and they are, um, they probably have schizophrenia 
although I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so I can't really diagnose them. But, you know, the government is controlling their thoughts, has put a chip in them and is, you know, surveilling them and, you know, making them do things or making them feel things. And it's that's that's very difficult. And um, I have to give a lot of credit to my colleagues who have um, uh, psychology or psychiatry or social work backgrounds. They have helped me and others in our division to talk to these folks and to help them um, find the help that they do need and that, and that, that it's not from our office, unfortunately. As, as a coordinator, were you actually answering the phone? Yeah, I mean, well, so... OHRP is one of the few offices, I think, in the federal government where every person who works in our office, our phone number is on the website. And so anytime anybody wants to contact us, they just go down the list. And my name, my last name begins with a B. And so I am often one of the first people that, that, that gets called. Um, now, actually, my, I have, do have colleagues who have um, A's or, you know, the... <laughs> B A instead of B O, and so they might get called before me. But um, um, and even you know, as I said, when 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 the when the phone rings to the main number, they'll get transferred to us. Even when I was a, a coordinator, and um, or let's say you've opened a case and you you are still not sure about what happened and what what went wrong, and so you may call the complainant who is. Not always, but often a subject in the research, and say, "Well, can you tell me a little bit more about your complaint or your allegations?" And um, so there, you know, there often is a lot. Or they'll call you. They'll see the determination letter on the website, and they'll call you to say thank you. Or they'll call you to say, "Wait a minute, you didn't make a finding about this allegation that I made about such and such." And so, in some ways, you know, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't, because um, oftentimes. Nobody's happy. Um, and so you have to have a real thick skin. You have to have a real thick skin to be in compliance oversight because when you, when you make a finding, then the institution is sometimes unhappy. And when you don't make a finding, the, the subject is unhappy or the complainant is unhappy. And so, um, and so for, you know, some people are just not, out, not cut out for compliance oversight, either because they don't have a thick skin um, or because they don't like being the bad guy or or they don't like the details. They don't like to, to get lost in, in sometimes tedious um, review. I, I'm trying to think, what about you may have facilitated your thick skin so that you're a good fit for this job? So I'm imagining your demanding father, imagining being the youngest of five and having to you know, put up with all of that. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think also... There, you know, everybody has a, some concept of sacrifice, either because of religious upbringing or um, because of being in a, a sport that they love where they had to practice a lot, or a musician, I'm also a musician, and having to, you know, and so you, sometimes to do things that are important and that mean a lot to you, Sometimes you have to sacrifice some things, and um, and I th I think that that's part of it. That that putting up with the the arrow slinging is a sacrifice that I make because the job that I do and that we do is so important. And as director, then you have much less a hands-on role with the cases that are open. I have less time to actually. Um, be you know the lead on a case although uh you know i do review all of the all of the cases all of the 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 letters that are written by the staff uh, of my division i don't get into the nitty-gritty like they do usually on some cases you you end up having to like the support study um but uh for for a lot of them i leave a lot of that analytical work up to them and um but we also uh, one of the other things that we do and that we're all involved in is to review incident reports. So as you may know, um, institutions are required to report certain things to us, including certain kinds of noncompliance and um, unanticipated problems involving risk to subjects or others and suspensions or terminations of IRB approval. And we get, you know, hundreds of those a, a year. And 
they have to be reviewed and responded to. And we also have a database that we enter those into. And because of staff shortages and other things, we're sort of behind on that. And so everybody has to pitch in and, and, and process those incident reports. But I'm probably one of the few people in the division that actually enjoys it because I really <laughs> love, I know, again, <laughs> I'm such a nerd. <laughs> But I really like seeing, first of all, you get a real flavor of the different kinds of research that's going on because it's all in research, it's all in human subjects research, and, um, and to some extent the things that can go wrong because it's usually, there's usually suspension because there's a problem, an unexpected an anticipated problem it has the word problem in there and you know non-compliance that's something that has happened that's wrong but I like to see how the institutions are fixing it you know what are their corrective actions that's really what we're looking at we're seeing what are they doing to make sure this doesn't happen again and um, I, you know that's that's very gratifying to me to see that and to help them along if I think that they're not quite getting getting what what it is that they need to do and um, so that's also that's a, an important and I think interesting part in my job. Uh, one of the tensions in the research ethics field is between furthering research and protecting the subjects. Can you comment on that? So uh, I, you know, I'm definitely um, I can absolutely see both sides. As I as I said, you know, my my first. Um, interest was research. Um, you know, granted it was basic research, but I see the need and the importance for research and research on, on people, on humans, and you sometimes can't do that without actually using human subjects. And um, on the other hand, I feel like I am more of an advocate for the research subject and protecting them. And I understand there's a tension but sometimes I feel like um, myself and you know other people in my office sometimes feel like we're the lone voice for the human subject and and to to say, okay, look, maybe we need to um, um, step back a little bit and and make sure that we're not moving ahead too quickly. And um, but I I I. It's not to say I don't think research is important, and I do think it needs to go forward. And I think that, you know, the name of of our office, though, is the you know, Office for Human Research Protections. We're there to protect people, um, but we're a part of the Department of Health and Human Services, and their you know their function is to advance research. But it's you know making sure that that research is ethical. What do you think one of the big challenges is in the future? regarding protecting human subjects? I think that that the, the big challenge includes making sure that this tension is, is paid attention to and that the um, that we don't go off willy-nilly in one direction or the other. And I you know I, I think uh, Dan Nelson you've probably seen this this, this picture, you know, a hundred times where he shows, you know, the, the tug of war, like it's actual a, a video, you know, a little cartoon of, of people playing tug, tug of war. And, and on one side is, you know, is, is protection. And on the other side is research at all costs. And, you know, if you go over on one side, uh, too much protection, there's alligators on this side. And if you go too much on research at all costs, there's alligators on that side. So, you know, making sure that, that we don't go too far in, in either extreme and making sure that, and I, you know, I, I saw, you know, presentations on, you know, I've been hearing a lot about these uh, learning, uh, you know, uh, learning health systems. And I think that that's a, um, a very intriguing concept and I just hope that we make sure that we keep the subject and the patient in mind and and that their rights are, are protected. Well I think one of the most interesting um, ethical issues for the future is in the realm of gene transfer and the possibility of actually you know changing people's 
genome. Uh, and and it's one thing to say I'm going to change your genome and you're no longer going to have cystic fibrosis, and then it's another thing to say I'm going to change your genome so that you can run faster, or um, read better, or something. And so I think that that is a fascinating area and is you know ethically so rich for looking at what are these issues and is it right or wrong to go that. You know, even just to change the genome, because then you're doing it for future generations. It's easier for us to imagine that's okay for a disease that is, um, you know, that may be killing thousands of people or you know making people um, disabled. It's a it's a harder leap to go into whether or not this is just for enhancement, as they, as they say. And so I think that that's an area that is um, going to be a real challenge, I think, in the, in the not too distant future. Well, you mentioned that you hadn't received any formal ethics training in the course of your PhD or your... Do, do, you, do you think that that would be a good idea for our researchers, their, their, our new generation, current generation of researchers? What, what's your opinion? On that? I do. And, and, I, and I guess I... I do recall that I did have some training on um, um, sort of the ethical conduct of basic research, sort of the, um, you know, from the research misconduct standpoint, um, reporting results accurately and not plagiarizing and making sure that authorship is appropriate. So I, I, I guess I can, I can restate that. I did have um, some training in that. And I think that it happened sort of late in my graduate career, and I think it was because the, you know, the department that I was going to was getting money from an agency that said, in order to continue to get money from our agency, you're going to have to do this. But there was a, a, a fair amount of, we're doing this because we have to. Not really. We're doing this because this is really important. And so um, hopefully that has changed and that, and that there's, they're implementing those, those kinds of curricula. You know, for, for, a, for a basic scientist, um, learning about human subject protection is probably not necessary or a good idea, but certainly the, 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 the basics of, of conducting ethical scientific inquiry is a good idea and it needs to happen early and it needs to happen sincerely and and to to make students realize that this is really important not we're just doing this because somebody told us we had to what do you think the average person on the street needs to know about research the way research is designed reviewed approved conducted that's a hard question because it, it it can be very complicated, and the average person on the street may never um, be approached to be in a research study, um, or may you know never find themselves wanting to even consider that. But I think that it's important for folks to know that you know most medical advances involve research and that there are people out there who dedicate their lives to conducting the research, to making sure that folks are protected as much as possible, and that who actually are subjects in the research. And um, they are, you know, giving of themselves in a way that is very laudable and you know we've seen um, websites that you know talk about these these research heroes and they really are heroes and to appreciate that and to but also to make people realize that you don't have to be a hero if you don't if this is not for you you don't you don't need to be in research um, but that that these are the the kinds of questions that are being asked, and these are the kinds of ways that we need to answer them, and that you know what it actually means to be in a research study. That in often cases, your choices are being taken away from you, or from your doctor, 
and what that could mean for you. So if you really wanted one or the other of these um, interventions, then maybe research isn't right for you, uh, that you, you can get this intervention outside of the study. And those are some of the, the important things for people who are actually considering being in research. And, um, and for, you know, for folks who live in um, Montgomery County, Maryland, where I live, which is close to the National Institutes of Health, you're, you often see a lot of opportunities for research, even if you don't have a particular disease. And so I think that, um, and, you know, it's probably true in Boston, too, and in other areas of the country where there are a lot of um, research facilities and research hospitals and so forth. And I think that more and more people are learning about it. And also, as, as you know, we've heard on the internet, if you, if you have some you know, disease or some concern about something, you can get on the internet and you can find all about research. And I think that people are, are educating themselves more. And I think that it's important for them to know that research is something special. And that, you know, if you do this, then you are special, but you don't have to do this, mm -hmm. that you can make an another choice. And that's okay, too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just to feel free to make a decision. And that can be hard. I, you know, as I found out, sometimes $50, it doesn't sound like a lot of money, does it? But it was a huge amount of money for a graduate student in the late 80s. And um, I felt like, to some extent, I didn't have much of a choice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we know that there are folks out there who are, you know, just as vulnerable or more vulnerable. And um, making sure that they um, do have some good choices and that if they do, you know, if they get into it and they say, Ooh, you know, this is what wasn't what I was anticipating, that they are free to withdraw and that they will not lose, um, you know, some of those benefits. What do you think the average researcher needs to know about OHRP compliance oversight? <laughs> that we are not um, evil monsters that we we care about them and we also care about research subjects and we care about research and that we are really there to help i know that's you know cliche and i'm from the government i'm here to help but really really are and even you know just um um you know i'll see somebody at a meeting or something and let's say oh, i don't want to bother you it's like don't you're not bothering me this is my job i really i I, I'm here to answer questions, and and that's that's what I get paid to do, and it just so happens that I love it too. So that helps too. Can you recall something in the, the course of your career that you are really proud of? Something that you personally have worked on, or your work group, or your department, or your institution? I am very proud of my division and the 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 compliance oversight cases that we have that we have done and that when we have called attention to um, problems in research studies and brought about changes that people have said you know what you're right this was wrong and we need to start doing better and there was, you know, there have been, you know, several cases. We had a case involving um, studies of uh, uh, a hip pad, you know, where the, the, the research involved a, a garment that had padding on one side but not the other side. And, and they found out and, and, um, and they were randomized to getting padding on either one side or the other. And they found out in the middle of the research that the, the subjects were falling preferentially to the padded side. And they tried to hide this information and, 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 you know, didn't inform the IRB and didn't tell the subjects. And, and that's just wrong. You know, as soon as you knew that this was happening, this is, you know, this is so important, not, not just for the science, but for, for the subjects, because, and many of these subjects were not capable of consenting for themselves. They were nursing homes and their families were consenting for them. And they're, to think that they didn't know about this, I think that that was, you know, really a bad thing. And to call attention to that kind of thing 
I think is very important and to, to make it, to make people think that, and you know, granted most researchers are not, are not doing that. Um, they, 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 they all knew it. Oh yeah, that, that would be wrong. I would never do that. But even some of the cases where it's smaller things that are not quite as egregious to say, oh yeah, I need to pay more attention to that. And so we do that, I think, through our determination letters. But, you know, everybody in the office does that when they talk to somebody on the phone or when they give a presentation at a meeting or, um, you know, helps draft a, a, a policy guidance and things like that. And so I think that you know, I'm just, I'm sort of really proud of my office and, and the the work that we do and people, I, it's always sort of gives me a smile when I, when I tell people, you know, how, how few people are in our office, like how many people are like 23, 23. Oh my gosh. Because I feel like our influence and our effects are so much bigger mm -hmm. than our numbers. And that's, that speaks well to the quality of the people that work there and the passion that we have. If, if you could change one thing with our regard to resources needed, I mean, you're the boss, you can do whatever you want. What would you change? If, if you could finish the sentence, if only. For, for OTRP? Sure. Um, boy, that's a hard question. I think I, I would definitely hire more staff because there's so much more that we could do um, that there are, you know, like somebody was saying to me, somebody came up to me and said, so somebody told me that you could do site visits all the time. And I told him that you never do site visits. And I said, well, it's somewhere in between, but you know, we are only able to do maybe two or three site visits a year and, you know, compare that to FDA where they're inspecting virtually every IRB every five years. There are lots of IRBs out there that we have never done a site visit for. Large institutions that do a ton of research. If we had more staff, we could do that. Um, if we had more staff, we could do more education programs, but then we'd also need more money for travel for all of those things too. So I guess money is a big, a big thing. Um, and, you know, just being able to to develop all the, you know, because people say, well, you know, you don't have guidance on X, Y, and Z. And we're like, we know we're working on it, but we only have so many people. And so having more staff would allow us to, to write more policy guidance so that there would be fewer holes in what, what people understand about our interpretations of things. Well, then, um, if we kind of sort of recap this journey through your career, can you identify then personality traits in yourself or a skill set that you have that has been particularly useful as you've made this journey to where you are now and makes you so passionate about your job? Um, compassion, I think, is one thing. Um, empathy for people who are hurting. Um, doggedness, to, you know, not, not give up when, when things get hard. And... Um, of course, you know, the, the boring analytical skills. I'm, I'm, I'm an analyst. <laughs> and then your face gets all twinkly <laughs> when you say it. <laughs> and I'm a geek too, so. <laughs>